Hello everybody, hello all the storytellers around the globe. Um, today I have a special guest and I think I announced her to I announced her to you already. It's Vicky Moore and she wrote this fantastic book Life Beyond Should. And um, I will tell you all about it in a minute. And um, Aharuto, it's you already. Okay. Oh, Caroline, that's so nice. Hello, Claudia. That was quick today because I everything went wrong in the preparation and I wasn't sure if it worked out with my mobile. But great, you're there. Everything's working out fine. Okay. So, um... Let me start with the first quotation of this really fantastic book. Um, how many hours do you spend a day doing something you want to do? And how many items on your to-do list are actually for you? I want to welcome my guest Vicky Moore today and she wrote about life beyond should and that we all have a lot of shoulds and a lot of expectations in our lives and um, I met her a few months ago and then I read her book and it changed a lot of the ways I even look upon my own life. So now I have to invite her in. Everything is improvised as always. Woo! I hope the mobile doesn't fall down. Los Angeles. And she does speak German, but she prefers to... Ah, hi, Vicky. Hi. Hello. Oh, great to have you. Um, Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, okay. So I have to fix my camera a little bit. Otherwise, you just see my eye. Okay. All right. <laughs> so um, uh, before I start asking you all my questions, um, I would like to say that I really, really enjoyed your book and that it uh, changed a lot of the ways I... Uh, started to look uh, upon my own life and I'm, I've been writing diaries and uh, stories as you know for a long time and I always knew, uh, thought I know my life pretty well and I know um, that my goal is my goal or that the expectations that I have are really my expectations and since I read your book this has changed a little bit um, and in your book you're writing a lot about that we are uh, human beings in the modern corporate world we have a lot of shoulds in our life and um, before we dive into that into the different kinds of shoulds and expectations i would like to ask you can you tell us a little bit about your own story and what made you write this book and and pick this topic yeah so um yeah the, the book did come uh, from my own story Uh, from a time in my life when everything in my life was changing all at once. So around 2012, 2013, um, really everything in my life changed. The relationship I had for 10 years uh, suddenly ended. Um, I moved out of my house. Uh, the business that I had built in Los Angeles that I had been running successfully for 10 years, I had to give up for a variety of reasons. And, you know, what a lot of people would look at is as sort of a catastrophe of everything falling apart. I took a step back and I looked at, okay, everything in my life that I thought was defining who I am is now not there any longer. And, you know, what can I do with that? And I had always had a dream of living in Europe. And I thought, well, now I don't have these attachments any longer and I can follow my dream and go live in Europe. And I started telling people this. And of course, I mean, I was, you know, at this point in my life, I was in my mid 40s. I wasn't, you know, 20 backpacking through Europe. And so as I started telling people about my dream and what I wanted to do, I got a lot of advice about what I should do, what I should do about my relationship, what I should do about my business, what I should do about my career and all the things I shouldn't do. Oh, you can't give up everything and move to Europe. It's a huge risk. What if you fail? What if? And I actually wrote a journal entry. You're talking about writing diaries and journals. I actually wrote a journal entry that was titled Life Beyond Should. Oh. Because I got so much advice from everybody about what I should do from people who hadn't done it, right? None of the advice I was getting were from people that had you know, lived abroad 
or started a business or, you know. And so this was 2013. And then I did move to Europe. And the second part of the story is after I moved to Europe, I started talking to people and I heard a lot of, oh, wow, that's really great that you did that. I wish I could do something like that. And then it was almost immediately followed by, but, and then all the reasons they couldn't do something like that. Uh -huh. And these were, I mean, these are, you know, you know, people with a lot of talent, people with a lot of intelligence, people accomplished in their career, but they were limiting themselves from doing something that they really wanted to do because they believed they couldn't. And that was really what inspired the book. So the move and the conversations I had with people, I was like, well, if I could do it, I mean, there's nothing special about me. If I could do it, then certainly they could do it. And I just really wanted to communicate that message to people that it is, it is possible. Wow. Wow. Great. Thank you. This is su it's such a fantastic story. And I could just, you know, right now I could just spend uh, an hour asking you, but yeah, but why, why was the splitting up? What happened to your business? Why did these people ask you without you asking them for advice? Why did, why did they tell you all your, all your shoots? So uh, we, we could talk about that for a long time, but um, I think we should go uh, come to your, to your book. But before I do that, I, um, um, because I think there's a lot of uh, special things about you when you say I'm not special, but I think you're very special and I, um, I don't know you that well, but when I, once I, I started reading your book, I realized, wow, this is so fantastic. This is so well written. And one of the things that I really like in particular about your book, because I'm not uh, the typical, I, um, I really love um, novels and I'm not really as uh, a self-help uh, book reader or, um, or something like Sachbücher in German, but your book is full of storytelling and you tell these amazing and, and very um, motivational stories about other people. Um, so uh, was that clear right from the start that, uh, that the storytelling will be a, uh, uh, like real stories from real life and even from your own life will be a big part of this book? Yeah, that was exactly it. I wanted to I wanted to show that quote unquote normal people could achieve exceptional things. Mm -hmm. And so I intentionally I got a lot of pressure from the publisher at the beginning to interview people, you know, big name people, right? People that would, you know, you see their name in the in the book description and like, oh, I want to read about them because they're, you know, the CEO of a company or they're a famous actor or they're and I really, I was like, no, I want to tell the stories that people haven't heard. I want to tell the stories of, of people that are in the circumstances that we're all in, but that had a big dream and they were able to achieve that dream through the different strategies that I talk about in the book. And so that was very intentional with the people that I, that I interviewed to sort of get the behind the scenes stories that you don't hear about in the media all the time. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and also, I thought it was very courageous, because you tell very personal stories of your own life. And I, I mean, I, I'm very fond of that. I really like that. But um, not very many writers do that, especially not in Germany. I think it's a bit different in the United States. But in Germany, most people are so scared about telling personal stories about themselves, so they won't do that. It was, um, it's still something I'm getting comfortable with, to be quite honest, because I've, I've had a corporate career for the past 20 years. And this book is very different than the work that I do in my corporate life. And my colleagues don't know this side of me. Uh -huh. And now suddenly this is out in the world with my name on it. And now my colleagues will know stories about my life that I've never told them before. And so it, it's a little bit, um, yeah, it makes me nervous a little bit, but it's also a really liberating feeling, right? Now this, there's this really authentic version of me in the world that I can be very professional and very corporate and be very good at my job and also have this personal side of the experiences that I've had and why I show up the way I do in the world, even at work. I mean, that's, we bring our, our personal selves to work. So why yeah. not share that? 
Yes. And that's one of the biggest mistakes that I think that still exists in the corporate world or almost everywhere that they think that you have to leave your private, your personal life outside when you come in. And I think this is somehow really difficult because this is all one. I mean, we are not, uh, you cannot split us half and half. So, um, and I think a lot of people uh, all around the world would be so much happier if they could be more authentic and tell more their truth even at work. Yeah, and, and I think luckily, you know, that that is starting to be a topic at work. Managers are starting to realize that, that they are starting to, you know, embrace more empathy and emotional intelligence and diversity. And so the fact that that's even starting to be a conversation, I think is a really a good sign that we're moving in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, now that we know a little bit about you, um, let's start like the way you start in the book, because you start with what is an exceptional life and uh, what you need and what don't you need? Or Because you were saying uh, a lot of people think, I mean, I don't have the quote right now, but a lot of people think they have to be exceptional and very talented and uh, very lucky to have an exceptional life. And you say, no, this is not the case. Can you uh, dive into the way you perceive a, an exceptional life and what it needs to lead an exceptional life? Yes, well, I mean, it is a very personal definition, of course, but I mean, my definition of an exceptional life is leading a fulfilled life where you get to use your unique talents and capabilities in a way that both makes you happy and contributes something to the world around you. And so my version of an exceptional life has nothing to do with how much money you earn or, you know, how many followers you, uh, followers you have necessarily. So it's a little bit different than the traditional, you know, what's publicized as the, you know, the Hollywood definition of, of exceptional. Yeah. Yes. Um, but, you know, what I, what I found in interviewing people for the book, the reason I define it that way from my own, per my own personal experience, but also the people I interviewed, I interviewed so many people that had achieved that definition of success. They climbed the career ladder really quickly. They had fabulous jobs and travel and, you know, expensive holidays and, you know, all of the worked for top name brands. They had all of the traditional sort of media defined definitions of success and they were miserable and they were miserable because they weren't what they had achieved. The goals they had achieved weren't in line with their values. And that's really the difference I find is if you, if you, if you create a life where what you're doing and what you're contributing is aligned with your values and who you are, then to me, that's success. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's so interesting because in my point of view, this has this, what you just said about people having goals that didn't make them happy. This has so much to do with storytelling because in storytelling, we very often we tell that people are pursuing their goal and they have certain expectations with their goal. And by trying to fight for this goal, they realize that in achieving this goal, they will never uh, reach that expectation that they are hoping to get or this, this dream that they're hoping to get. So they have to uh, change the direction and find another goal. And um, I uh, found that very interesting because what you say basically is um, people are not very happy uh, when they have this kind of, of uh, um, dreams and goals of wealth and, and um um, uh, status symbols and everything because these are not their go their goals, right? Well, yeah, but it, it and I want to be really really careful because it can be a goal to to have a lot of wealth or to be the CEO of a multi million dollar company. This this is a legitimate goal for a lot of people yeah, yeah. if it's aligned with your values. So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. but yeah. you just have to be really careful with why why you're pursuing that goal. So for example, there is a CEO in the book who started a company uh, to develop um, flavored water without sugar. And she 
put her career on the line and put all of her personal investment into this company to, to develop water without sugar in it. And yet now it's a, it's a very successful company. Um, but her goal wasn't to make a lot of money. Her goal was to help people be healthier by creating a healthy beverage that they could drink. And that's the difference is you can still be successful, but it's the underlying, why am I doing this? And I think, you know, when we think about our goal, when you, when you break down a goal, it really comes down to three different things. What do I want? Why do I want it? And how will I get it? Uh -huh, and uh -huh. we've gotten so caught up. Our, our society now is so fast moving. We're in such a hurry to get to the goal that we focus on the what and the how, and we completely skip over the why. Yeah. And the why is the important part. Why am I doing this? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, but let me, uh, um, uh, let, let me go back uh, again to the before before, uh, before we dive into that. Um, it was because you were saying to lead an exceptional life. It's not you don't need uh, because you said a lot of people say, "Oh well, I will never have that because I'm average or I don't uh, I'm not talented enough." So and you said talent or um, the the good family or uh, wealth or anything doesn't have to do with it. So what? What what do you need to lead an exceptional life that's aligned with your values? What what I found was that really what it takes is clarity of purpose, understanding what you want and why it's important to you, and having that why it's important to you makes a difference because then it the the real differentiating factor between people who created an exceptional life and, you know, what you would describe as, is, you know, average is the consistency of effort, the pure, consistent effort, practice, learning, um, you know, hours and hours of doing things that move them closer to that goal. And one of my, one of my favorite stories from the book, Darian Douglas, who's a musician, he's a jazz musician, he plays in New York. Uh, and, you know, he grew up in normal circumstances and, you know, it was studying music from a young age. He knew he loved music. He wanted to play the drums. That's what he wanted to do. And so he, from age 11, I think he said he's, from the time he was 11 until today, he's never had a day where he didn't play music. So he had consistent practice put a lot of effort into his studies, focused on learning from other people. And then he put himself in places where he would have the opportunity to build his career playing music. And so a lot of people consider them lucky breaks. They focus on the lucky breaks. Like he got to play with a really famous jazz musician in New Orleans. He got invited to play a set. And so, oh, that's a really lucky break. You know, that had never happened to me. But that lucky break happened because he drove to that club an hour and a half in each direction every single weekend for months on end to watch these musicians play. And then finally, one night, they invited him to play. But it wasn't, you know, it did just happen. He put himself in the right place to have that opportunity. And I think that's what people miss. And so, um, and it's the same with talent. Right. He even said, he said, you know, talent has has very little to do with it. He said, if you think about all the talented musicians in New York, he said, it's like trying to be, you know, it's like trying to be a, a starting player in, you know, basketball or football. You know, there are so many talented people, but there are only five open positions. So, yeah, yeah. You're one of those five open positions, yeah. you know, it, it, Talent is only a very small part of it. And, and I really love that because it's the effort that goes into it and putting yeah. yourself in consistently in places where you have the opportunity. Yeah, that's so beautifully said. I, I uh, like the story of the drama very much too because the way you described it, you could see that he, he uh, the, you said he for like many years, he didn't really have much money and he would go to the... I think Central Park or something in New York to play 
for free and had to stand get up at I don't know in the middle of the night and, this, and, yeah. and, and so this is a good example for somebody who really who had a goal he really wanted to to reach and he did a lot for it but we a lot of the people I know they don't even come to this stage they have a goal and they want something and then there are so many other people talking them out of it and then they get very small and they don't trust themselves anymore and I see this happening so often and it always breaks my heart it does it fucking does because how can any person in the world try to talk somebody else out of something he really wants. I will never understand that. That's a horrible thing to do. Yeah, I should have a flag saying that and carrying it with me all the time. So anyway, what re uh, I, I, I built the bridge to, to this topic. What really touched me in the book uh, was, uh, because in my eyes, the, the drummer, he's kind of an exception. And and we more often deal with people who want something but they don't really have the the courage so much more and uh, by the way your book has a has a solution or a program a motivational uh, help program that's called courage which i like very much and the way you put the the meaning of the words but we will come to that later and um mm -hmm. But what really touched me was the story, which is kind of the opposite of the drama story uh, about yourself. When you said uh, you were standing in front of the, the executive committee and you had to fight back tears. Uh, can you tell that story and what it made you, what it, how it opened your eyes about something? Yeah, so uh, this is a story in my, so I got a, uh, a job in my corporate career when I moved to, when I moved to Germany, of course, I needed a visa to live in Germany. And so I got a, a job with a large uh, multinational corporation. And I was very happy to have this job because it allowed me the opportunity to be in Europe, which was my, my goal. Um, but the job itself was, was very stressful and very scorecard oriented, you know, always, you know, checking all the boxes and corporate goals. And um, I, I, I worked really hard and, and you know, in, enjoyed some of what I did, but, but really gave a lot of effort into everything I was doing. And um, I traveled, and this was a meeting with all of the managers from Europe. And so I traveled one morning uh, from Germany to uh, England went to this meeting at 9 a.m., stood in front of the room to give a presentation. And this was not, I mean, I'd been doing this for two years. I give presentations all the time. It was not a big deal. I knew these people. And I'm standing giving a presentation and all of a sudden, as I'm giving a presentation, I hear my, my, my voice starts, starts cracking and, and I, I feel tears in the, in the corners of my eyes. And I'm, I'm talking about PowerPoint slides. I'm like, what, 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 why is my voice cracking? What's, what's going on here? And, and I could see it in the faces of my colleagues. They, they heard it and nobody was sure why I was on the verge of tears. And I managed to get through the presentation and, and quickly get out of the room. And it didn't occur to me until I was getting out of the taxi as I got back to my apartment at 10 p.m. that evening it didn't occur to me that I had just worked basically a 16 hour day and about 15 minutes of that day had been something that I had actually enjoyed, something that was for me. And, um, and I had been doing that for a long time and it was just, it had just all come to a point where it was just too much. I, I finally, finally something in my brain said like, no, we can't do this anymore. Um, but it really took that. It took being, you know, al almost crying in front of the executive committee for me to realize that this was not how I wanted to spend my time. Yeah. Yeah. It, the story really touched me because um, uh, I know very well times where I was standing in an extremely stressful job and, um, and, uh, and and telling myself this is my dream job and this is what I always wanted to do. Why why do you feel so unhappy? And uh, I didn't have I didn't find that answer until much later. But it's so I think we all know this that when that we have 
a, a to-do list that's so long, especially today with all the social media and everything, our to-do list gets longer and longer. And finally, we noticed what did you do that you actually enjoy? What is something that fills you with the beauty of the moment? And um, oh, I have to take a deep breath now because we should really kind of more often step aside and say, what have you done today that really makes you happy? And um, and the, the answer that you give in this chapter or how you uh, how you go on is, that uh, you say, you, I think you say something like, um, I had been too busy fulfilling other people's expectations so that I, I forgot to think about my own expectations. Uh, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, that's, that's exactly it. I mean, it's, it's it, it very, um, very prevalent in my industry is, the, you know, the, 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 the mantra is always exceeding expectations. Mm. But when you think about the expectations you're exceeding, right, it's always something that somebody else wants from you, not necessarily something that is, you know, fulfilling, fulfilling you with you know, the things that you're passionate about or, or, or moving you toward, toward a personal goal. So yeah, we do. We spend a lot yeah. of time checking boxes from what other people what other people want from us. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then we don't even stop. Uh, once we exceeded the expectation, we don't even stop and say, yeah, I made it. You know, I mean, this is, it, this is really, uh, this is really, um, I had, a, I had a, a, a wonderful moment last week because I started singing lessons in autumn and I um. have a great, I have a great teacher. He's an opera singer. He has the nicest voice and, and, and he's very funny and very charming. And I always flirt with him like hell. And, but my singing was really poor. It was horrible. It's, I could hear it sounds awful for half a year, but I knew somehow here are nice sounds in my throat, but I can't get them out. And last mm -hmm. week, for the first time, I didn't know how it happened, but there was one sound coming out that was that that was actually quite nice. And then I just stopped and we both threw our hands in the air and we danced like online, you know, because I was so happy and I, I thought I knew there was a nice sound there. But what I want to say is we don't often enough, we don't stay there and say, this is so fantastic. And now I'm just not working anymore. I would just get pissed and have a nice time or something. We don't, we are so reasonable. And then we go to the next obstacle and to the next um, expectation. And yeah, uh, and, but uh, coming back to the story, how, uh, why do you think, how could this happen? What, what, or how does this happen in general to people? Why do we forget to think of what we really love how what makes us what are the expect what, what does it have to do with expectations and the shorts that you're talking about well so so when you think about life i mean expectations do serve a purpose we all have them and they, and they help us they make our life easier right we, we have expectations things are going to be a certain way and if you had to if you had to think about every single thing you do and every decision you make every day it would be overwhelming. You know, you, you wake up, you expect the electricity to work, you expect the water to work, you expect coffee to taste like coffee. You know, you go to the store, you expect the store to have certain items that you need. So it makes our lives a lot easier to have expectations. And this is also the case in our careers and, and our friendships and everything else. But what happens with these expectations is, well, two things happen. We, we get what we expect. So we actually change our behavior to be in line with the results we expect. So it's a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You, 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 you've got it in your head that this is what's going to happen. So that's what happens. And you think about like an important interview. And if you're worried, your expectation is, oh, I'm going to mess up. I'm going to say something stupid. I, I'm going to be, I'm going to be nervous. Then you end up having a bad interview because you've already set the expectation for yourself that you know, it's going to go badly. Um, but then your point is a really good one. When things go well, when we have a positive expectation and things go well, 
we forget to celebrate it because, well, that was supposed to happen, right? It's what we expected to happen. It was supposed to happen. So we just run right over it. We accomplish something really great and we run right over it to the next thing, to the next task, the next thing we're supposed to do because, well, we expected that it was supposed to happen. It's not a big deal. <laughs> so it does, it, it either, you know, it sets us up for failure or it takes all the joy out of the things that we actually do accomplish by sort of having this preliminary thought of the way things are going to be. Um, and then to your point about, you know, what's in the book with the shoulds, how we get caught up in this is our expectations are really based on the information from the world around us, from other people, from media, from our own experiences, from our past experiences, from what people have told us, um, you know, our parents, our teachers, our colleagues, media. And so we have expectations of the world and the way we're supposed to be that are given to us. So if I always got bad grades in school, for example, you know, I expect that I'm not very good at math or I expect that I'm not very smart because I always got bad grades in school. Well, those two things aren't necessarily the same. So I've now formed an opinion about myself that's not really my opinion. It's based on a past experience I had or something somebody else told me. And then that sets up how we behave. And we, we do this, we play this really mean trick on ourselves where we just believe all the information that comes in without without questioning it <laughs> yeah yeah and and um uh and the, the the interesting thing that happened to me while i was reading your book is um that um I, I i always have a lot of expectations about myself and i'm very strict with myself and um, but then i started thinking what of these expectations are really mine and what are from my parents and what are expectations from others and i wanted to please them and i wanted to be loved and this is one of the really of the really horrible thing for women that we grow up learning now not only women men too but i think a bit more in women we learn that it's important to be loved because then we will get more and um so we try, always try to fulfill other people's uh, experience or like or important people's experience. And that's one of the like the devil's circle in a way, because then at some point we forget what do we really want? Is it that way? Mm -hmm. No, that's exactly. And you bring up you bring up something really well, two really important points. First of all, all of these all of these shoulds, all of these expectations we have of ourselves are really based in sort of basic human needs for safety, security, love and belonging, um, and esteem. And this is where it comes from. These are things that we, that we need to be healthy and have healthy relationships and have a fulfilling life. Um, so they're, they, they come from important places, but they get expressed in ways that don't necessarily help us. And these are the, these are the shoulds about, now, I should act in a way that everybody likes me. I need to. I need to make other people like me in order to fit in, or I need to please my parents and do what they say, or um, you know, I need to please my boss. And so, the intention, the underlying foundation of safety and security and acceptance is good, but the way we create it in our lives doesn't necessarily help us. It actually does the opposite. Oh yeah. It actually, when we're, when we're inauthentic, we're, when we're like people pleasing is one of them. When we're trying so hard to please other people that we're not paying attention to our own values, it ends up distancing us from other people because then we're not ourselves. Then we're acting constantly. We're, we're an actor in our own life and we're, you know, we constantly have a mask of something yeah. Something other than who we are. And so it creates it creates exactly the opposite of what we of what we want. But I don't want to lose this point. You said um, you know, women especially this affects, and there I actually found as I was researching the book, there there are several studies that that point out as um, as we're developing as as young adults, 
that women, particularly young, young women, particularly suffer from this problem at a greater extent than men. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and the, the young women, young women entering college more than, I, I believe the statistic is more than 50% of women in their first year of college feel so overwhelmed by everything that they should do that they don't even know what they want anymore because they're so busy doing all the things that everybody tells them you should do. Yeah. You should get a good job. You should major in this. You should, you know, whatever. And, and they're so distracted by, by trying to do all the right things that they forget what they want. <laughs> yeah, that's horrible. That's horrible. And I, I must say, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, I was absolutely like that when I was very young. And, and still and, until very uh, recently, like a few years ago, I, I, I uh, caught myself so often that I did things to please other people. Um, because I thought that was necessary and I just I couldn't stand it I, I, I still hate it when people don't like me because I'm doing so much for others and if they don't like me then I hate them <laughs> you know which is really awful and really stupid and I, 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 I will make a kind of a stand-up comedy about that one time but um, so these shorts that you were talking about the things that we think we should do they very often don't really come from ourselves that we really want them but they come from other people because of expectations and everything so what would you say to the people who are listening today or in the in the next days what because i think a lot of people kind of know that they probably fulfill expectations that they don't really that they are not their own and that they have a lot of shoulds but how can we find out which should or which expectation is really ours and which not and how can we get rid of of the shoulds that are really not doing us any good well to find out which ones are, are ours and which ones are coming from other places one of the easiest sort of exercises I've seen to, to dive into that a little bit is um, a method I learned from my corporate career called the five whys. And basically the, the theory is to get to the root of any problem, you just have to keep asking why until you can't ask why any longer. Ah, okay. And what it does, so a real simple example, you know, I want to lose weight. Why? I want to be healthier. Why? Okay, so if you take the I want to be healthier, the answer to that why could be I want more energy so I can play with my kids. Or it could be um, I want to feel more confident at work. Or it could be I want to run a marathon next year because that's a personal goal. Or it could be um, I want more energy so that I have more time in my personal life to write a book or what. So the, the very simple, I want to lose weight can go down so many levels. You know, if you think about, I want to be healthier so I have more energy so I can play with my kids. Then oh. the, goal, the goal isn't, I want to lose weight. Uh -huh. The goal is I want to be more present for my children. Yeah, but yet yeah. we've attached a we've attached a superficial yeah what we're told a should yeah to some to some underlying much more foundational goal that's in line with our values and so I think asking keep asking why until you can't answer it so there's no longer another answer to the why and then that's the real goal. Uh, okay. Uh, this is very interesting. I have to, I, I know now why I did that. Like the one thing that I'm really harassing myself about, I will just tomorrow morning, I would just try that out with the five boys. I'm really nervous what's going to happen. But is that what you said about losing weight? Maybe that's the reason why I don't lose weight because it, I, um, I just want to look better and I want to uh, wear my old clothes and I don't really have anything like, um, being more energetic and playing more, have more time with my kids. I, you know, it's, it's just more like a superficial wish. So probably that's why I cannot, the shoot isn't working that I, I don't, I don't lose weight, so to say. Yeah, it could very well be. There's, um, 
And there's a psychologist, um, Susan David, that talks about the difference between have two goals and want two goals. And have two goals are basically a should. You know, I should lose weight because the world tells me I need to look a certain way. I need to be healthy and fit, you know, multi-billion dollar industry with all the health products out there. Um, but if it's something everybody else tells us we should do, our doctor says we should lose weight. My boyfriend says I should lose weight. I mean, if I don't really want to lose weight, no amount of other people thinking I should is really going to motivate me to do it. But if, if there's some attachment to it that's important to me, then, then it's in line with, then, you know, my brain actually catches up to that. Like there's an underlying value that's important and therefore I'm going to put effort into achieving this goal. Kind of back to the original point, the reason people achieve exceptional results is they put a significant amount of attention and energy and effort into achieving those results. And so if it's not important enough to you to put a significant amount of attention and energy into it, then it's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we, were, we were making a bit of fun now with the weight loss uh, example. But of course, um, uh, it can have absolutely dramatic uh, consequences for people's lives when they have too many shoulds and they are just not living the life they want. I mean, I have friends and acquaintance around me and I can see they are unhappy and I don't even know it because they are just not doing the things they really want to do. They are running from one uh, task to the other and never take their, their time. And it's, it's really heartbreaking. And in some cases, I'm very worried that my baby, this friend will have a heart attack or something too soon, or he will end up being, uh, having um, diseases because he, for, for 40 years, he never took his time to relax and to, not worry about money or anything so um it does ha it, it does make people unhappy these shoulds yeah. that we are talking about well and it makes them unhappy and, and and being being unhappy in that way in that sort of stressful way is unhealthy i mean several people that i interviewed for the book had had, had already had multiple burnouts so one of the women that i that i interviewed She had had two burnouts before she was 26. Now, I mean, you think about burnout and you think about, you know, top level CEOs that are, you know, 40, 50, 60 years old. This woman had had two burnouts before she was 26 because she was pushing herself so hard to check all the boxes and achieve all the goals that she thought she should do. And it finally, it, it took that sort of a complete meltdown for her to realize, you know, to slow down long enough and look about, look at the goals that she was achieving and, and, and where they were coming from. And, yeah. and then she realized, she realized, well, yeah, I'm, I'm achieving all these things and I'm doing really well, you know, successful by, by all definitions, but miserable and ill. I mean, that, I mean, it's, but you get to the point where you're that miserable and it actually has a physical effect on your body. And that's what really is the danger, I think, for people. Yeah. So and uh, for so the uh, because we we've been mainly talking about the first half of your book, and this is where you tell all these really fascinating stories about um, where the should and the expectation come from and what it does to people and how they could overcome it. And, but this uh, and I really like the way you made these two parts. That the one part is called um, the stories we are being told, right? And mm -hmm. the part is the stories we could tell or something the stories we could create we could create yeah i love that one i mean as you know i'm just a storytelling lover and uh, so this is such a, a beautiful because in a way it's it's absolutely right because uh, storytelling is so powerful and in uh telling our stories we can create our life and we can create it in absolutely new ways that um, haven't occurred to us before. And I, there's one example I like to give all the time. It's um, if you tell your story with the best possible outcome, if you just tell it with the best possible outcome, you will 
lay a path here in your brain. And once the mm -hmm. path is there, it's so much easier to walk the path than if you hadn't told the story before. So yeah, uh, really because because we want the people to read the book, uh, especially the people who have issues with too many shorts and too long to-do lists mm -hmm. in their life. So we, we will only quickly touch the second part, but um, you have this fascinating concept of courage, which is, uh, I suppose, uh, th this is your system to help people and motivate and inspire people uh, to find solutions for their uh, for their problem, right? Yeah. So it's really my attempt to make it easy for people to find strategies to overcome the, the various shoulds because each person will be affected. You know, we're all different. Each person will be affected more by one or two shoulds than others. And the strategies that used to overcome them sort of match up. And so the second half of the book is seven specific strategies to move past should and actually accomplish what you want to accomplish to create the life that makes you happy. Uh, and you can mix and match them. Um, so that's how I, how I structured the book. Yeah. So, um, but the concept of courage came to me partially from the interviews and the different strategies I saw that people were being successful with, but also because, you know, in the earlier story, when I moved to Europe, I heard for, for more than a year, I kept hearing how brave I was. And I, I just couldn't understand why people were telling me I was brave. I was like, well, I didn't do anything brave. Like I'm not, you know, rescuing children from famine. I'm not fighting fires. I'm not, I, like, I moved to a country with a good infrastructure and good jobs. How is that brave? <laughs> and, and, but then I realized as, as I was talking to people, what they meant was they meant this sort of personal courage that it, it, it does take, it takes a little bit of internal bravery to get past the things that everybody else thinks you should do and actually do what's important to you. I was like, oh, that's what they meant. And so that's where courage came from. And then each of the each of the letters of courage is a specific strategy to overcome one of the particular shoulds. Um, and it's it's the stories from real people and how they've how they've achieved that and what they did and um, you know really sort of ideas for how you can apply that in small ways to your life. So this is the thing that I found is really important. It doesn't have to be a big leap. It doesn't have to be, I'm gonna change overnight and go from you know, A to Z. It can be, I'm gonna look at this one thing different in my life. Like you said, laying those pathways in our, in our brain, just changing the perspective slightly and doing one thing differently can start to lay those pathways and build that courage over time so that you get more and more comfortable being authentic, more and more comfortable taking the kind of risks that you want to take in order to achieve your goal. Um, yeah, more and more comfortable um, overcoming obstacles and facing challenges. And so it's really a step at a time, little by little. Yeah. Yeah, I I just love that you call that you call your strategies courage. Um, but before um, before I say why, I want to because I have two more questions for you, and I want to ask or please, dear listeners, if you have a question for Vicky, please write the question. And also, uh, oh yeah, I want to know. I have a new Facebook group that I want you to join, but I will tell that at the end. So uh, get back to come back to because I'm telling saying that yet now with this, with the messages because it always takes like almost half a minute before the questions here, so we have mm -hmm. to fill the gap in. You know, um, I love that it, that you call it courage because um, first uh, of all. Um, 
I had a major um, turning point in my life three years ago. And all the things that, on, that are on your list of courage, clarity of purpose and overcome expectations and all this, um, these were things I had to face. And uh, and I had to face the the worst fears of my life because I change I had I let go of the one dream I always had that was making that dream that was making me so miserable that um that I just couldn't breathe anymore I couldn't laugh anymore I couldn't feel anymore and I had to let go of that but I had to, the feeling that if I let go my biggest dream who am I I'm nothing. Without me, if I haven't achieved the dream, I'm nothing, and it was so horrible. And I must say, I I needed the most courage in the last three years, and courage, and no matter how you put it, because we always talk, everybody talks about transformation and change and do it differently and this and that, but there's no, it's in my point of view, there's no easy way. You need courage. You need to be able to face fear. Otherwise, it's 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 not going to work out. You need, yeah. to, right? Yeah. You yeah. need it's, to have the stamina to go through fear and say, "Yeah, fuck that! I'm really afraid right now, but I know why I started this journey, so I just better keep going." Yeah, no, it's very very true. And one of the things that kept me going through this process because I also needed a lot of courage to to. You know, go through this process, um, I, I, I noticed it as I was interviewing people, all of, the, all of the steps of courage are all traits that we have naturally as children. Like we're born with these. This is really the whole point of the book is we're born with exactly what we need to lead the life we want to lead. We have it all already, but we forget it. We get so busy doing all the things in the right order, you know, pleasing all the people, checking all the boxes, we, for, we forget that we've got these sort of innate abilities that help us to really have the courage to pursue the big dreams or pursue what we want to achieve. And as I was, as I was going through each of the strategies, and you think about the way a child plays, and the way they you know, learn to ride a bicycle, and the way they color, you know, when a child learns to ride a bicycle, they're not worried about falling. They just, they get on the bicycle and they fall and then they get back on and then they fall again and they get back on and they fall again. And they keep going to learn till they learn to ride the bicycle. You don't see a kid sitting there on the pavement going, well, guess I'm just not ever meant to learn to ride a bicycle. I guess I'll give up now. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's um, so nice. This is such a nice quotation for towards the end that we are born with everything that we need. That's so nice. I, I keep forgetting. Yeah, yeah, no, and we are, we are told we should learn this and we should learn that and we should do this online course. And I mean, I love learning, I must say. I love learning more and more and more, but, but actually we already have so much that we can use for ourselves. Yeah, or at least to tap into, like you said, because we because we need courage. We need we need courage to you know when you're you know as you described facing a really big change in your life. You know that that requires a lot of courage to to let go of one direction and to start moving in another direction. It, you know that's it's a really difficult thing to do. Um, but if we remember that we have these things inside of us that we can tap into when we need them and, and pull them up to help us through those situations, um, it just makes it a little bit easier. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. Absolutely. So now for the, for the end, I'd like to ask you, um, um, do you have two practical tips for the listeners how to overcome um, our shorts? Yeah. Okay. How do you the, I should do this. I should do that. Like you know, let's say it's a normal day, um, and I get up and I have so many things on my to do list. And how can I, uh, how can I deal with not stressing myself out and just letting go of so many? I should do this and that. I, uh, I guess my first tip would be really think about 
you know, even in the, in the busyness of the moment, really think about <clears throat> where is the should coming from? Is the should something that is moving you closer to a goal you want, or is the should an expectation that somebody else has? And it's fine if it's an expectation that somebody else has. For example, if, you know, if I need to do something for work, okay, you know, my, my work achieves a goal that I have. So, you know, of course, during the course of a day, you're going to do things that fulfill other people's expectations. This is normal. But thinking about where they come from and is it moving you in a direction, even if it's an expectation from somebody else, is it moving you in a direction that you want to go in? Is it taking you closer to something you want to achieve or is it pulling you further away? And, you know, the example with you know, almost being in tears at work, in that case, I was fulfilling a lot of shoulds that were pulling me further away from where I wanted to go. And, that yeah. was, and that's the thing. Um, and then one really practical tip that I've learned from other people, it's not my tip, um, but I love it. And I think it works really well is instead of getting caught up in the to-do list of all the tasks that you need to cross off, take time, you know, on a Sunday afternoon or at the beginning of the week or, you know, whenever you can carve out 30 minutes and really think six weeks from now or six months from now, what are three things that are really important to me that I want to have achieved? And just write those down and put them somewhere you see them every day. And then as you're starting to check off the to-do list, just glance at those three things every once in a while and look at the to-do list and say, okay, is it, is it getting me closer to those three things or not? And if it's not, then you can still make a decision. Okay, I need to do that because, you know, it has to get done. But it keeps you really focused on paying more, uh, prioritizing the, the things that move you closer to your goals rather than just checking off all the things everybody's asking you to do. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful tip. I would do that because my to-do lists are so long. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I could be a millionaire if I got a penny for all the to-do lists. <laughs> and um, I would definitely do that. Um, and thank you, thank you so much, Vicky, for being here. I just want to, um, although you can't read it like upside down, but uh, this <laughs> is what we've been talking about. It's it's really beautiful, and it made me think a lot. And and also, it was very. I loved it because it's so entertaining. And I need, I don't know, I need stories and entertainment. Otherwise, I don't read anything. I must admit, I'm really bad in that. So. Um, I thank you very much, Vicky, for being here. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It was really a pleasure, and, and yeah, and I'm so inspired by, um, yeah, by your storytelling and and you know the the passion power that stories have. And so I'm yeah, I'm glad I was able to share a little bit in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I hope we can have another t a longer talk sometime and dive deeper into certain stories. But for today, I think you uh, everybody got a good um, impression of the um, of what's the book about. So um, I I want to let you go now, and um, I wish you a beautiful evening. And um, oh yeah, and my Facebook group. I wanted to say something about my Facebook group because I have a new Facebook group that's called Tell Unforgettable Stories. And if you are interested in storytelling join me on Facebook because we will put a lot of beautiful content and uh, storytelling and interviews in it. Oh, Claudia, sir. thank you so much for the really interesting talk. Thank you so much, Claudia. That's nice. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, everybody, I wish you a beautiful evening. And um, Vicky, I hope I see you soon live. And um, yeah, thanks for being here. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, Catherine. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Oh, it's...